Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be determining if we can do chemistry with human hair. So the paper that we're looking at today was suggested by somebody in the Discord, and we actually got this one recommended a few times. When we look at this paper, we can see that it claims you can use human hair to catalyze the selective reduction of nitroarenes to amines. So starting with a nitro group, we get an amine. And what this paper claims is that you can reduce nitro groups to amino groups using sodium borohydride with human hair as a catalyst, although the catalyst loading is fairly high. So the claims that this paper makes are as follows. In recent years, increasing attention has been paid to the catalytic nitro reduction using transition metals, such as copper, cobalt, palladium, nickel, gold, and zinc. Additionally, it is claimed that human hair is considered a minor excretory organ for trace elements, such as iron, gold, copper, manganese, magnesium, chromium, cobalt, zinc, and nickel. For example, red hair contains relatively high concentrations of iron, whereas white hair has low concentrations of manganese. Now, I didn't check these references if this is a valid claim. I just kind of thought that that was an interesting thing to consider. I don't usually think about hair color as being related to the content of transition metals. If you know anything about this, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say down below. The content of trace elements in hair depends on different factors such as geographic residence, environmental characteristics, age, sex, and color of hair. So essentially, they're saying depending on the hair that you use, you might get different results. So the takeaway here is that brown human hair from a female was ideal, whereas dyed hair performed worse, only giving 20% conversion. Now in the case of brown hair from a female, 99% conversion was observed. Additionally, when using natural white hair from an older male, only 46% conversion was observed. Finally, when they tested this reaction with cat hair, they only observed trace conversion, which I think is pretty hilarious. Essentially, the hypothesis of this paper is that by treating the hair, it is possible to convert the trace metals in hair into metal nanoparticles, which may catalyze the reduction of nitroarenes in the presence of sodium borohydride. And while they claim this, they didn't do any mechanistic investigation. And so a previous example using metals to do a reduction with sodium borohydride is shown here, where you can see nickel nanoparticles were used to reduce nitroarenes with sodium borohydride. And in this paper, they use sodium borohydride as well as hair as a catalyst. Now there's a couple other things here that might make you think that this paper is a little bit dodgy. So the initial concerning thing is that they didn't actually have any structures in their paper. Although at the end of the paper, they had a scheme where they defined what all the possible R groups on the ring were. And so I've just drawn them out here to just simplify things for you. So if you've never seen a synthetic methodology paper before, this is an okay scope. This is the typical scope you'd see in a journal like Journal of Organic Chemistry, where you have a lot of simple examples with things like halogens, maybe multiple of the same group that you're doing chemistry with, maybe an alcohol group. This is a little bit better of a scope to see something like an alcohol or an ester, as well as examples with heterocycles. Those are always nice to see. So overall, this looks like a decent approach. You might wonder why most synthetic chemists don't use methodologies like the use of nanoparticles or hair. And that's just because they're kind of obscure and most people don't have access to those nanoparticles. Even if they're commercially available, they just kind of feel weird to a synthetic chemist. So you're not gonna go with weird. You're gonna go with the tried and true methods, stuff that dissolves most of the time. Now there are exceptions, but I would say generally speaking, I wouldn't consider using a methodology that wasn't using a standard run of the mill set of conditions. So here you can see these are all the different anilines that can get produced using this chemistry. This chemistry seems to work pretty well. The yields that they give are decently high. And so we thought that we would actually go ahead and try this chemistry. But before we tried that, I just wanted to highlight that they do have NMR spectra in their paper. And you can see that these spectra are processed using Mestronova. So here's an example with this um, diamino chlorobenzene, as well as this heterocycle derivative with an aniline. And so these are definitely clean looking spectra. I'm not too concerned. Yes, there's solvent peaks and some stuff that they haven't labeled, but that's totally fine. I accept that these are legitimate results, at least based on their spectra. Now it doesn't tell you how they made them, even if they claim yields and stuff, they might've somehow produced these using an alternative methodology, but we're gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. Actually, we're not. We're going to test their chemistry. We're going to see if we can cast doubt or remove doubt. So how is the hair prepared in their procedure? We're going to be following this experiment. We need to make sure that we're doing things the same way that they did. Initially, two grams of human hair was crushed into small pieces, washed with distilled water, and vacuum dried. So they take the hair, crush it, wash it with distilled water, and vacuum dry it. This just gets rid of any debris, I suppose. After the hair has been prepared, it's ready to be used for chemistry. And so what they do is they prepare an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide, this is a base, and they add one gram of the crushed human hair to the reaction and stir it at 50 degrees Celsius until the hair was dissolved. If it wasn't for the fact that I had actually seen a video of the dissolved hair, I would have been extremely skeptical about this because they claim that the hair dissolves. So if you're interested in seeing that, I'm going to show you guys later, so make sure you stay tuned. 
Afterwards, the nitrobenzenes that they were looking at with sodium borohydride and ethanol were added and the reaction mixture was stirred for the appropriate reaction time at 50 degrees Celsius. Then, the reaction mixture was washed with ethyl acetate, 3 times 5 milliliters, and the organic phase was separated. So they're just washing this and then extracting everything that's organic. Further purification of the amine product was performed by plate or column chromatography using hexane and ethyl acetate as eluents. This is just a standard run-of-the-mill procedure, no major red flags. The place where people deviated included starting with just cutting the human hair into small pieces, and then washing it, vacuum drying it, and then cutting it into even smaller pieces afterwards. So what actually happens to the human hair when we do this sodium hydroxide treatment? This is a scanning electron microscope image of the hair before washing. As you can see, there's lines that indicate these are big strands of hair. This looks like what you'd expect hair to look like under a microscope. After sodium hydroxide treatment, you can see that the hair looks kind of like gum. This is no longer ordered. This has been broken down and decomposed. So the structural integrity of the hair has been compromised. And now we have what looks like gum. If you'd like to see a couple other images, here's some transmission electron microscope images of the human hair after being treated with sodium hydroxide solution. They provide these in their supplemental information. This shows that the hair has been treated and it may enable the metals to be released into solution. And maybe that could form nanoparticles under a reducing environment. So this is kind of just indicating that yes, the hair gets broken down and the stuff inside the hair could get released. Maybe that would be able to do chemistry. The first person to test out this chemistry was Frank. In this beaker, we have approximately 5.7 grams of hair, which actually looks like a lot. That looks probably like a 100 milliliter beaker. You'd be surprised how light and fluffy hair is. Or maybe you wouldn't. Afterwards, this was washed. So you can see here we have our nice washed beaker of hair. After the washing process, the hair was dried. And finally, the hair was cut up and weighed. Now, I haven't told you about the most interesting part of this whole story. Let me back up for a minute here. As I said earlier, the optimal hair for this procedure was to use brown female hair. That's what the authors identified. So Frank is an absolute MVP. Frank asked his supervisor, who happens to be a female with brown hair, if she would be willing to contribute her hair to this project. And she, in fact, was extremely willing to. So massive shout out to Frank, as well as Frank's supervisor, for contributing to this project. I thought that that was amazing, and it makes this whole video way funnier. So thanks again. So you might be wondering, does the hair dissolve? Yes, it does. This is the aqueous solution of hair. It almost completely dissolves. You can see a couple little strands of hair in there, but more or less everything has dissolved. So the hair does dissolve, color me surprised. These were the conditions that Frank used. Frank ran three reactions. The first reaction was with four nitrobenzaldehyde with three milliliters of water, 0.75 milliliters of ethanol, and sodium borohydride at 50 degrees Celsius. This reaction, because it doesn't have any other catalyst, will only reduce the aldehyde to an alcohol. So in the paper, they used an alcohol, and to verify that this worked, Frank had to prepare the alcohol as a standard. This alcohol, once it was formed, the crude solution of the alcohol with additional sodium borohydride was transferred into two flasks after three hours. The first one was stirred at 50 degrees Celsius, and the other one was cooled to room temp, and palladium on carbon was added. The purpose of palladium on carbon here is that it will actually reduce the nitro group to an aniline in the presence of sodium borohydride. As was stated earlier, palladium in the presence of sodium borohydride is able to reduce nitro groups to anilines. This was our standard to check if this chemistry actually worked. The third setup was as in the paper, but with double the amount of basic solution so that the one gram of hair was dissolved in six milliliters of basic solution, sodium hydroxide and water at 50 degrees Celsius. To this solution, ethanol as well as the starting material were added with sodium borohydride. So the hair was dissolved, then we added the solvent, then we added our compound with sodium borohydride. So Frank's substrate was an example reported by the authors, but as I said before, he had to prepare it first, so this reaction without any catalyst only converts the benzaldehyde to a benzyl alcohol. The nitro group remains untouched. However, in the second example, you can see that the palladium on carbon is present. So both the benzaldehyde as well as the nitro group are able to be reduced to the benzylic alcohol as well as the aniline respectively. Now in the final example, we have the same conditions as the first example, but we also have human hair as a catalyst. And this is supposed to make the benzyl alcohol with the aniline as a product. So let's see what happened. So here we have a TLC plate. TLC stands for thin layer chromatography and the spots on the plate are as follows. On the left, we have four nitrobenzaldehyde, which is the starting material. Then we have the partially reduced compound where the benzylic alcohol has been formed, but the nitro group is still present. Then we have the reaction done using human hair as a catalyst, as well as the reaction with palladium on carbon as a control. And so you can see this first spot is the aldehyde, the second spot is the alcohol, and then we have both in the case of hair and palladium on carbon as a catalyst, a new spot by TLC, and this is the aniline with the benzylic alcohol. Now we didn't get any NMR data for this example, but fortunately we do for the next one. So fortunately, Saito and Lutthier were also both willing to test this chemistry as lab mates in the same lab. 
Here you can see the washed hair, which has been cut up. It's also able to dissolve in a solution. You can see this dissolved hair here, which is nice to see. Definitely the hair does dissolve. So in this case, instead of using brown female human hair, they actually used black hair from a human male. The reaction that Saito and Lutthier tested was the reduction of 2-nitropyridine. This wasn't an example reported in the original paper, and so they thought it would be good to test this novel substrate. Using the same conditions as mentioned before, they tested out this reduction. Here you can see this first case, we just have sodium borohydride, the sodium hydroxide, water, ethanol, as well as the hair, 50 degrees Celsius for 12 hours, and this reduction occurs. So as before, we have another TLC plate where we can show the reaction progressing. And so here we have first the starting material, which is just the 2-nitropyridine, as well as a co-spot, which both has the starting material and the reaction mixture. Here you can see the reaction mixture on its own. And then here's a standard of the product. So you can see that the product, which is the 2-aminopyridine, as well as the reaction, have the same retention factor. They've moved the same amount, and so they're both the same compound. And we're going to see some NMR data to back this up as well. So the first NMR is the starting material. This is the 2-nitropyridine. You can see that there's four protons from this one, two, three, four positions on the ring. These all uh, have nice splitting pattern, which isn't super relevant here. We're just showing that this is clean starting material. The things I want to highlight here include the chemical shift of these peaks, 8.7 and 8.3. You can just remember those two as we'll be looking for those spots in the product. This was done in deuterated chloroform. So in the next one, we have the crude reaction mixture in CDCL3, and you can see that none of the 8.7 or the 8.3 peaks are present anymore. There might be like the tiniest little hint there and a tiny little hint there, but that could just be some other peaks. So in addition to the peaks that we would expect from the product, which should be four other peaks integrating to four, we integrate one, two, three, four here. We have some other peaks, so this chemistry isn't perfectly clean. It's possible that some other chemicals were being extracted out of the hair as well. Additionally, we can see a peak which roughly integrates to two. This big broad peak likely is occurring from this NH2 group. When I looked up this compound in the literature, it had similar chemical shifts around this range. So it seems like this chemistry works pretty well, to my surprise. In summary, this paper claimed that human hair can be used as a catalyst for the reduction of nitroarenes into anilines. Members of our Discord verified this chemistry with one substrate reported by the authors, as well as one unreported one. The authors claim that the presence of trace metals in hair can act as catalysts for the reduction of nitroarenes. So it turns out that this chemistry actually works after all, which was definitely surprising for me, and I'd like to thank everybody involved with making this. It was a fun project, and I hope we get to do more projects like this in the future. Have a great day.